Okay, if we can invite Dr. Collado to join us again, and we'll have a brief uh, uh, discussion period. We'll go for maybe 10 minutes, and then we'll have, let you all have your, have your break. And um, there's uh, more, more questionnaires? Okay. After that. Okay, we have another questionnaire coming up to see if you learned anything during your, your presentation. So, um, Serpo, why is aplastic anemia more common in Asia? Is, uh, have you ever, is it a you know, toxin exposure uh, um, issue or genetic basis? What, uh, what leads to a higher rate of this uh, occurring here? So at first we thought that drugs may be the cause of high incidence of aplastic anemia in Asia. Also the chemical exposure and the viral hepatitis. But uh, it come out from our epidemiology study that the drugs is the uh, small etiologic fraction for plastic anemia. And also the same is true for hepatitis and chemical. And most, most patients in our series are uh, idiopathic. Have, have studies been done of telomerase, given the we haven't done importance that uh, Dr. Claudio showed? Okay, uh, Mort? Yeah, uh, Dr. Collado, I'm fascinated by your talk on telomerase, and I'm kind of having a little difficulty resolving the fact that short telomerase, uh, short telomeres creates cancer, and yet we know in cancer we have overactivity of telomerase preserving telomere length, and of course when we use immortalized cells, of course, we have telomerase in excess as well. How do you resolve the two? Yep, that's uh, that's the, the paradox of... Uh uh, telomeres and telomerase, and um, it's first. The first thing is that these patients they um, they usually have uh, uh, heterozygous mutations, so they do have one of the alleles uh, is normal, and they they keep the full activity of uh, of their telomerase. And eventually, when they have chromosomal instability, most of the cells in the cancers uh, they develop. Uh, duplicate or at least overexpress the normal allele that is um, has retained the function of telomerase. So they still, once they evolve, they can overexpress telomerase. The other thing is that in about 10 to 15 percent of cancers, uh, especially sarcomas, they do not express telomerase at all. They use another mechanism that is collectively called ALT or alternative lengthening of telomeres that is telomerase independent. And apparently we know very little about it, but we know that it's based on uh, sister chromatid exchange between, of telomeric material between the two uh, sister chromatids. And you have this exchange of telomeric uh, sequences from one chromatid to the other. And this might explain why uh, these patients may eventually uh, develop cancer. You're right, there, there are very, uh, uh, quite a few trials trying to use telomerase inhibitors to treat cancers. Uh, although we don't have any uh, final data on that anymore, we know from the lab that when you inhibit telomerase, you can get uh, growth stop from, for these cells. Okay, Steve? In the mid-'80s, we reported on two untreated patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia who had aplastic anemia, and they had a reverse CD4, CD8 ratio treated with ATG, and they went into a complete remission of both their aplastic anemia and, ironically, their CLL. I was curious, what is known about the ratios of CD4 to CD8 at presentation, whether it predicts for response to any of the treatments? No. Uh, as far as I know, the, the ratio of CD4, CD8 uh, over the ATG is not defined to predict the, the response. But as I said before, the, 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 uh, the degree of uh, lymphocyte depletion is uh, quite different between the horse and the ATG. Uh, as you can see, the, the, the rabbit is a more profound uh, lympho depression. So we have to consider the dose of uh, ATG for the, the, to using the immunosuppressor therapy in aplastic anemia. Yeah, so ATG has been used for, for 30 years uh, for treating aplastic anemia, and we, uh, we really don't understand how it works. And you know, obviously T-cell uh, suppression is, is sort of the initial thought, but the activity doesn't correlate with the T-cell depletion of the patient. And, uh, of course, these are biologic products, and they vary from lot to lot. I remember the initial studies 
um, by Grotwall. Uh, they had a, a single horse that had great activity, and then when that horse died, then subsequent patients uh, did not respond as well. So there's some, something else you know, in the ATG preparation, uh, either direct or indirect, you know, versus stimulation of endogenous cytokines or uh, some other activity that's, uh, that's important here. And uh, you know, at least I'm, I'm unaware of uh, any further clarification of, uh, of that than, than just this mystery. Yeah, well, the, the, the horse versus rabbit um, ATG trial ran at the NH that from <clears throat> Phil Scheinberg that um, was presented. Uh, the, the initial idea was that rabbit would be what we anticipated was rabbit would be even better, but the results is completely the opposite. Uh, we understand very little still what's happening, but if you go back to the, the data, you can see that uh, although in, in vitro, the rabbit ATG, they can activate way better uh, the proliferation of uh, Tregs. Uh, in our patients, uh, the Tregs recovery in the peripheral blood was much uh, higher and earlier in the patients who were treated with horse ATG. So maybe this very intensive immunosuppression that occurs, maybe it's not suppressing the right T cells, or maybe it's suppressing too much the cells that shouldn't be suppressed at the time. But I agree that we have very little idea what's going on in, in, in the ATG that uh, is efficient uh, in treating aplastic anemia. So, Serpo, what, uh, when would you do an unrelated transplant in aplastic anemia? So results have improved. It used to be that the results were much poorer with unrelated donors, but now, now uh, recent, recent data is considerably Im uh, improved. And, and so at least we're aggressive in taking people who have failed immunosuppressive yes. therapy to do an unrelated donor transplant if they're still transfusion dependent. We, we in Thailand uh, haven't done much about unrelated transplant, uh, especially in a patient with severe plastic anemia. Yeah. Therefore, uh, we don't have much experience on a related transplant. How about you? Yeah. Okay. If a patient has apparent aplastic anemia but is found to have a clonal cytogenetic abnormality, should we consider that patient as having aplastic anemia or possibly myelodysplastic syndrome? And presumably the pathophysiology of those diseases are different, so does it matter? Well, I, I can try to answer that. The, uh, you know, Fred Applebaum actually had a paper a long time ago uh, addressing that same issue, and many times people with a, particularly a leukemia-related cytogenetic abnormality will relapse with leukemia after a, a, you know, a mild uh, conditioning regimen uh, treatment for, for aplastic anemia. So we ourselves consider those people to have MDS and give them a more intensive regimen to, to try to ablate that clone. Well, the same thing from, uh, um, I come from, from the NIH, so we also consider if you have a cytogenetic abnormality, it's considered hypoplastic MDS. Uh, the very severe aplastics are a diff difficult bunch because often they come with absent neutrophils, they already have a patch in the lung with fungus, or, you know, they have, would have bled. If you had a 50-year-old man with very severe, what would have been your option? Would you still go on with your conventional or would you transplant them? Age, age is uh, 60 years old. 50. 50. 50. Yes. In 50, mm -hmm. if actually donor is uh, uh, matched to donor and sibling, in case of a very severe, there's, an, there's no time to, 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 to waiting for the recovery of a response of IST. So uh, I would like to recommend if a patient condition is okay, I would like to recommend the transplant. For the chronic aplastics who have progressed, uh, they have had a, a, a moderately severe for one or two years, and they progress to severe or they become transfusion dependent. Is there a feeling that perhaps their stem cells are more defective or the stroma is less healthy, and that should veer you more towards a stem cell transplant than to try an immunosuppressive therapy in this sort of uh, situation? So the predictable response, as I said before, the, is the treatment of uh, the IST is uh, as soon as possible, not longer, uh, the not waiting. So if a patient is one or two years later, uh, IST there might be the low probability of a response. But however, you are going back to one to two years before, if a patient is a non-CBA for example, moderate aplastic anemia. So you have to wait 
to depending on the transplant dependent or not. If a patient of transplant dependent but non severe, you have to go to the, the uh, immune septal therapy as an initial treatment. Can I ask Dr. Rodrigo what is happening to the HLA DR15 people who are predisposed to getting this condition? What is happening to the telomere length and the telomerase activity in this condition? And particularly when we do transplant this group of people who with HLA match siblings with the same, you know, do we necessarily have to check? Yep. Uh, there is no relationship between the DR15 and um, telomere length or, or, or telomerase uh, activity. Um, as I, I, I sort of quickly showed, there, there is no relationship between the telomere length and the response to immunosuppressive therapy, but rather with the relapse and, um, and uh, clonoevolution. So apparently the, the telomere doesn't influence the immune mechanism that is happening, immune-mediated mechanism that is happening in these patients, but rather it reflects what's happening probably in the hematopoietic stem cell and its ability to respond after you get rid of the, the, cytoto the pathologic uh, T cells. So there is no relationship between the DR15 and uh, telomere length. Okay, last question. Yeah, Dr. Surapal, how, how common is hepatitis involved in aplastic anemia pathogenesis in this part of the world? And is there anything different you have to do about transplanting these people? Any precautions? Uh, in our country, the incidence of hepatitis B is about 10%, and we have seen very few patients with hepatitis B and C uh, in our series none in our uh, epidemiology study. Yeah. So I think that the uh, hepatitis is not the mm -hmm. common cause of uh, aplastic anemia in our region. Do I think, think the same uh, is true for you know, uh, uh, those in Taiwan, which uh, the incidence of hepatitis B is very high too. Uh, can we have the uh, questions? The audience response questions, please. Uh, in Taiwan, though, uh, hepatitis B incidence is high, but uh, uh, the course of uh, aplastic anemia usually is non A, non B, non C hepatitis, but not hepatitis B. Yes, we, it's correct. Okay, it seems that uh, we can have audience response later on. So. All right. Okay, so uh, you're released. Uh, we have a coffee break until 10.30, so you get uh, 25 minutes, and then please uh, be back for the next session. Thank you.